If drones become increasingly pervasive technologies, if they become really familiar, if everyone starts to have one, if they're internally in our skies, just like pigeons, then how might we start to relate to them? People always imbue them with their own imagination. They add the emotion to the play. So a lot of the show is really out of our hands and I create a really magical kind of environment to work in. It's a collaboration between airborne architecture and music. I got one phone call, kind of a, a late night in London, saying, John Cale, saw your stuff, is into it, wants to do something together. Our first conversation was like two years ago. It took a long time to find the right venue, putting these technologies above people's heads that are really violent. They spin at extraordinary speeds. These propellers are gonna take someone's head off if you let them. It required someone with some vision and some bravery to let us attempt it. And it really is the first time that, that these things have been flown above the heads of an audience. The risk was there. It's part of the package and it's part of the enjoyment. This venue was perfect for getting our feet wet because they'd never been there either. So today, I mean, we were really just sketching with technology. We were trying to just figure out how many we could fill the sky with. So we just put five up in the air at one time of all different species, all different scales, just to get a feel for how they work visually. We've managed to figure out just how to start to do things like carry John's voice on a flock of drones bounce his voice around the stadium, kind of filling the air with these remote voices drifting and dancing back and forth. We've mic'd up some of the drones and we've actually started to run them through the house PA. So we've created this wall of sound that's quite guttural that almost vibrates your body, which is actually just from the sound of the drones themselves. Having the two of them doing that is really great. I mean, it gives the whole thing a persona. You know, it's one, one just chasing the other. I was theorizing about how you attach names or feelings to inanimate objects and how you sometimes in the course of a theatrical performance, you have to be forced to change your mind about what that character is and how difficult it is to change your mind. If you have one drone up, it's a mystery. If you have two drones up, it's a love story. And if you have any more than that, it's a family brawl. All of a sudden you have categories. I mean, you made for you. And I'm looking at these two drones flying around and it's emotional. Because what you have is a sound that is typically associated with terror, actually becomes repurposed in a theater space like this and becomes quite moving and becomes quite emotive and becomes a cultural act as opposed to a military act. Yeah, they're being temperamental, sensitive. I don't understand, they get a chance to fly in barbecue, you know? <laughs> it's a good audience. Calm down, calm down. <laughs> This is very different to what we normally fly. We're uh, essentially pushing the boundaries of what these things are designed for. 
Like this isn't designed to fly indoors. It's designed to fly outdoors. The remit of where we're pushing them is uh, film and broadcast, but they can be used for agriculture, surveying, maintenance, inspection of buildings, of power lines. You can use them to scare pigeons on farms. You can use them to search for particular wheat spots in fields. So there are people developing them so that they fly autonomously and deliver medical supplies. It can be used in all sorts of manners. It's weird and wonderful and creative at the same time. Every morning after each show, we have to go in and do life support on these things and resuscitate them and get them back into working order. And it's that vulnerability of the technology, which I think is really interesting. The line between it dropping and staying in the air is really fine. And hopefully the audience can see that when they know it's hovering above their head. We've been spending a couple of weeks in here just setting up a mock-up of the Barbican Theatre and doing um, test flights and fine-tuning and calibrating that choreography system. For the tracking, it's a system that's normally used for, for model trains, and we get them to boost the range for us a little bit. And we are basically placing um, little receivers like this uh, all over the ceiling. Having a couple of these together uh, allows us to triangulate uh, 3D position of uh, one of the uh, little transmitters that we've got that sends out uh, ultrasound pings. Uh, that we then pick up in the sky and that is translated into a 3D position, a little blinking dot. We've been doing a lot of this, just uh, sort of running around the space with the drone over our heads. We sort of first came up with a set of characters that we wanted to create. Liam had quite a strong vision about what each of those characters would be according to what kind of subcultures they would come from. Trying to move away from like the typical drone costume like being really military associated. And sort of think about them as being the next mobile phone. So we wanted them to be playful and fun so people could look at them and laugh at them. It just makes you smile, like some of them are hilarious. So they all had different behaviors in the same way that every person has a different kind of walk. And it's through those little tweaks and quirks do you start to find your emotional attachments. So while we've been in the warehouse, John's been in LA in his studio putting together a whole series of new arrangements and scores for the drone orchestra. So he's taken some existing tracks and he's remastered them in the context of how long our battery lasts for. So now we have a new set of bespoke arrangements that are going to be piped through the drones. He's split off a lot of the tracks into different channels because some drones are going to take his lead vocals, some drones are going to take keyboards. So at the beginning, which one do you have? Mirable. Mirable. There was a song list and there was a design and we put the two together and whichever worked, worked. That kind of serendipity is the strength of the piece. It changed the music in the sense that I went back and I redrew the map of it. I changed the arrangements. I made them much harder. The fact that the arrangements were called just made the voice stand out more. The emotion and the singing, that much greater. So we're going to be in the middle of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just a forest of light. You know, just these sharp <laughs> columns Absolutely. of light, right? That's fantastic. And then at the back, we have a couple of super-powered searchlights. Uh -huh. You kill the forest for that one. Yeah, you're and talking you just, turkey you just do the searchlight. Yeah. That's it. I was waiting for something to show me that something was going to happen here. Because it's a collaboration of two very opposite things. One thing is really openly emotional, and the other one is openly closed system. I mean, most of the people that came to those concerts had no idea what to expect and didn't understand what they saw, which is amazing, which is really exciting. Fertile ground for a lot of imagination. 
And a big part of the project is to try and bring people closer to those technologies so we can start to understand them, we can start to connect to them in new kinds of ways. These are really defining technologies of a generation, but at the moment we're just on the edge of what they are and what they can be. just like pigeons, then how might we start to relate to them? People always imbue them with their own imagination. They add the emotion to the play. So a lot of the show is really out of our hands and I creates a really magical kind of environment to work in. It's a collaboration between airborne architecture and... I got one phone call, kind of a, a late night in London, saying, John Cale, saw your stuff, is into it, wants to do something together. Our first conversation was like two years ago. It took a long time to find the right venue, putting these technologies above people's heads that are really... If drones become increasingly pervasive technologies, if they become really familiar, if everyone starts to have one, if they're internally in our skies. Really violent. They spin at extraordinary speeds. These propellers are gonna take someone's head off if you let them. It required someone with some vision and some bravery to let us attempt it. And it really is the first time that, that these things have been flown above the heads of an audience. The risk was there, it's part of the package and it's part of the enjoyment, this is music. <laughs>